And we are going to be in John chapter 1, looking at verses 19 through 34. And the title of my message this evening is, Make Straight the Way of the Lord. Make Straight the Way of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this privilege to study your word. And we pray, Father God, this, this Christmas season, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, that you would find within us hearts that are open wide to let the king of glory come in, that we would be responsive to you and rejoice in all that you've done for us in making a way through Jesus Christ, that we may have a relationship with you both now and for all eternity. We pray, Father God, as we look at the life and ministry of John the Baptist, Father, that you would use this time to impact our lives, that in many ways we would take up that mantle of being an evangelist, of being a witness, because our world needs to hear about the way, the truth, and the life, our Savior Jesus Christ. So we pray that you'd bless this time through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And all my brothers and sisters in Christ said, amen, amen and amen. How many of us like math? Show hands. Anyone like math here? Okay, a few. Anyone like calculus? Fewer hands coming down. And you know what? I want you to know I agree with you. When it comes to math, I'm mathematically challenged. I was going to be a doctor. I wanted to be a heart surgeon. But I found out, number one, you had to be able to handle blood, which I can't. And you had to be good at the sciences, which I'm not, and math as well. And I remember going to the University of Washington. It was my freshman year there. And I thought, well, it's part of the, the required courses I need to take. I need to take a calculus course. And so I signed up, not really having a good foundation when it came to math, but I signed up for the course. And I'll never forget the first day introduced to the professor, a very small a uh, slight of form German man with a very, very thick accent. Very hard to understand anything that he had to say about calculus. But the thing I remembered most about him was how he would erase a chalkboard. You know, most people, when they would erase a chalkboard, use just one hand. But he did this whole thing like this. I never saw he pivoted just like that. Never saw anything like that at all. I would marvel. How does he do that? That explains why his waist is so trim. He's pivoting all the time. So it's, it's time for the big exam. First big calculus exam. And I, I have to be honest with you, I felt so poorly prepared. You know, when you don't have the, the building blocks, the fundamentals, you don't even know what questions to ask, even though they're asking you questions. And so I studied, but you know, when you feel ill-prepared, you get that knot in your stomach. That's exactly how I felt. I just felt so ill-prepared. I was so unnerved. I knew this was going to go bad. I just had that bad feeling in my gut. So it's the day of the test, and I'm looking at that exam, and I'm thinking, I'm going to take the best shot that I can at this, but I don't think this is going to be a very good test. I'll never forget, next time we have class, professor comes in, and you can tell he is very upset, very upset. And he opens the lecture by just ripping the entire class to shreds, saying that we're lazy, we don't work hard enough, just ripped us to shreds, and then he went on to say the average score of, a cla of the class was 10 out of 100. Now, I'm thinking all I want to see is two digits on my paper. A one followed by a zero, that means I made the average. But to my disappointment, I only found one digit on my paper, and that would be a big zero. So, at that moment, I realized calculus was not the thing for me, and I quickly withdrew from the class, so it became the very first and also the last calculus test I ever took in my life. How do you feel about that one, huh? Do huh? you feel sorry for me, anyone? Yeah. That's why I'm a pastor, not a doctor, okay? But you know, I think about that and that, that feeling of being so unnerved and ill-prepared and I think life can feel like that, too. I think many people are going through life right now ill-prepared, 
unnerved when we look at what's going on before us. You know, maybe you've been one of these individuals who say, I wonder what it'd be like if I lived during the colonial period, during the Revolutionary War or during the Civil War. What kind of person I would have been during that time, you know? How I would have tackled the obstacles that were facing the nation or the world at that time. I look at this time that we're in right now, and I believe we are faced with a similar period of time. And many people are looking at what's going on in our world today, and they say, I don't even know which way is up. I don't even know what to do. I feel so ill-prepared. And then you add to the equation, what happens when this life is over? Oh, then there's even more question marks. Am I prepared for when this life is over? And it's so important. I want to encourage you, for those online here on site, we need to understand God's heart for us. God's heart for us is that he wants us to be prepared when this life is over. And for the very first time, we stand in his presence. In fact, in John chapter 1, verses 19 through 34, we will discover what God has already done to help us prepare for that moment. How he, he has, in essence, made straight the way to heaven so that we will be ready and joyful when we behold God for the very first time. Let's begin in John chapter 1, verse 19. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the son of God. Now, two weeks ago, we started a new study through the gospel of John. And during our first study, through John chapter 1, verses 1 through 13, we noted that John boldly declared that Jesus is eternally God the Son, the agent and sustainer of creation, the life and the light of men. Then, during our study last week in John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, we noted that John also declared that Jesus Christ is fully human. John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now this means that Jesus Christ has two natures, divine and human, which were joined into one. 
into one being so that he's fully God and fully man. This doctrine is called the hypostatic union, the joining together of Jesus' two natures. And it's important to note, this is an essential doctrine of the historic Christian faith. To move away from this is heretical. You see, if Jesus is not fully God, then we do not have a perfect, sinless Savior whose life is of infinite worth to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. And if Jesus is not fully human, then we do not have a Savior because we could not truly identify with fallen humanity and represent us on the cross at Calvary to pay the penalty for our sins. But Jesus is fully God and fully human. Therefore, we have a Savior, one who represents God to us and us to God, which brings us once again to the Apostle John's purpose in writing this gospel. John chapter 20, verse 31 states, but these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John recorded the works and the words of Jesus Christ so that all may read and come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, by placing their faith in him for the salvation of their souls, they may have eternal life in his name. Well, in keeping with the purpose of his gospel, John next introduces us to the first of seven eyewitnesses in his gospel who testify that Jesus is the Son of God. His name was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is a unique figure in the Bible because he's mentioned in all four gospel accounts. So it's important for us to understand who he is because he plays such a significant role in the Gospels. It's important for us to understand who John was and also understand his testimony about Jesus Christ. And for those who are taking notes, first, when it comes to who John the Baptist was, it's important to note that John prepared the way for Messiah. John prepared the way for Messiah. Now, what I want to do is step back I want to give us an overview of Scripture, and I want to weave these Scriptures together to see how they point to John and how John points to Jesus Christ. So we're going to weave these things together. So we're going to go back to the Exodus. We're going to go back to Moses. They're about ready, the children of Israel, to enter into the Promised Land, and there's one question. Who's going to lead us after Moses dies? Who is going to be the prophet who will tell us the words of God? And in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, we see that God promised Israel that he would raise up prophets like Moses to lead his people after Moses died. It says, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And what you see through Israel's history is that God faithfully raised up prophet after prophet to direct Israel just as he had promised. But all that changed after the prophet Malachi. After the prophet Malachi, there were 400 years of silence because God did not raise up a prophet for Israel. Now, it's important to note that God warned Israel that this was going to happen through the prophet Amos, for he prophesied about a period of silence over 300 years before it happened. You see it in Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. But they will not find it. There it is. 
Now, what in the world was God's purpose in not sending a prophet to Israel for 400 years? Let me illustrate it this way. Have you ever been finding yourself, you're talking to someone and they're on a cell phone and they're busy on the cell phone, but they're nodding their head going, yeah, uh uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But you know, as they're on their cell phone and they're going, "Uh uh-huh, 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 as you continue to talk, are they listening? No, they're distracted by what's on that device, right? Now, I, I say this this way because I know you would never, ever do that to someone else, right? It just happens to you. You would never be distracted by a device. No, no. And so what do you do when you realize they're not listening to you? You're talking. The lips are moving, but they're not paying attention. You stop. And what do they do? They look up from their device because you're no longer talking. And they're wondering, why did you stop talking? Why are you not talking anymore? And they'll even ask you, what, what, what's wrong? Why are you not talking? That's what's going on here. That's what's going on with the 400 years of silence. You see, God had been talking through the prophets, but Israel was not listening to God's prophets. And so in many ways, there was a divine mes- message in the heavenly silence. And what was God's message? Listen to me and my prophets. Now, we need to see God's not playing games here. This is serious business. God realizes there's too much at stake when it comes to the eternal destiny of every soul that's been made in his image. And so there was silence. But it's important to note the last prophetic words that Israel heard before the period of silence. It was through the prophet Malachi. Listen to this. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. And then Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 and verse 5. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. And all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. Behold, I am going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Silence. And then after 400 years, a man dressed in a garment of camel hair with a leather belt fastened around his waist, whose diet consisted of locusts and wild honey, appeared on the scene. Matthew chapter 3 verse 4 says, Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now, first question, why the diet? Why the locusts and wild honey? Well, I did a little bit of research and come to find out locusts are a great source of protein. I don't know if you know that, but they have more protein than steak. And when you roast a locust, it tastes like chicken. I'm just kidding, actually. It actually tastes more like bacon. It actually tastes like bacon. So I think John was onto something here. This is a first century version, a kosher version of a honey baked ham, okay? Now, why the outfit? A garment of camel's hair with a leather belt to complete the ensemble. Well, the dress linked John to another great prophet in Israel's history, Elijah. According to 2 Kings chapter uh, 1, verse 8, the prophet Elijah was a hairy man with a leather girdle about his loins. And like John the Baptist, God had called Elijah during a very dark time in Israel's history with a similar message. 
a simple one, but a similar one. Repent, repent. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness and he's preaching. Matthew chapter three, verses one and two. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. John's making the way straight for the Lord. Repent is a key part of that. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, when John comes onto the scene, the 400 years of silence were over. Now, all four gospels link John the Baptist with the prophecy that was given by the prophet Isaiah 700 years before John's arrival. And notice the similarity with Mike Malachi chapter 3 and chapter 4. Isaiah 40 verses 3 and 5 says, A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 40 refers to the highway construction workers. And they were called to clear the way in the desert for the return of the Lord as his people, the exiles, returned from captivity in Babylon in 537 B.C. Well, likewise, John the Baptist was in the desert. And he's preparing the way for the Lord by calling God's people to return to him. You see, Israel at this point had fallen away from the Lord. They had replaced a relationship with the living God for burdensome rules and regulations. Oh, they had mastered the art of looking religious, but their hearts were far from the Lord. So John's message was simple, yet confrontational. Repent. Now, John the Baptist's message is not what some today would call a seeker-friendly message. It's not seeker-sensitive. It's not seeker-friendly. And unfortunately, many churches today, what do they do? They soften the gospel because they don't want to offend the non-Christian. And these pastors want to have people feel comfortable, so they entertain them before they introduce the gospel to them. But when you look at John's message, there's nothing soft about it. Yet large crowds from Jerusalem and Judea came out to the Jordan to confess their sins and to be baptized by him according to Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And it's important for us to note, the truth is, the word repent is a good word. Let me say that again. The word repent is a good word because the word repent means to turn around. To have a change of heart and mind, which is confirmed by our choices. To repent means to get off the wide road that leads to destruction and walk the narrow path that leads to God. You see, John wasn't trying to verbally assault and harass people by calling them sinners. John was trying to pry their eyes open to see the dangerous path they were traveling on so that they may get on the right path, the narrow way that leads to eternal life, the path that Jesus Christ spoke of in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, when he said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter by it, for the gate is small. And the way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. Now, why did Israel need to repent? Because the kingdom of heaven is near, John said. Now, this means God's rule in heaven will be extended to earth 
through the Messiah and the coming of his kingdom. And so God was offering his kingdom, which ultimately they rejected. So the kingdom's been delayed, but it will occur after the seven-year tribulation period. But John's preparing Israel for its arrival, fulfilling his divine calling by making straight the way of the Lord. And when you look at John's message, you look at Jesus' message, you realize they're proclaiming in many ways the same message, which is why Jesus taught his disciples to pray to our Heavenly Father for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, we need to make that our prayer now. This is a very important prayer for us to pray now. You want things to really change? We need Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus. Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will, your will, your kingdom. Now, the word of John, the Baptist ministry, it spread throughout the region. And John 1, verse 19, records that one day Jews from Jerusalem, these were the religious elites of Israel. They sent a delegation of priests and Levites to interrogate John the Baptist. You see, they wanted to know who John was. And notice John's response in John chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So they asked, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. I want to break this down because it's important for us to understand what's going on here. First, please notice how John's response gets progressively shorter Why? (laughs) Because John the Baptist wasn't sent to talk about himself. He was sent to talk about Messiah. There's a whole other message right in that one alone, but I'll reserve that for another day. It's also important to note that in the first century, many Jews anticipating the coming of Messiah, but some groups like the Essenes at Qumran near the Dead Sea, also expected the coming of three figures to establish God's kingdom, a prophet, a priestly Messiah, and a royal Messiah. Well, get this. Since John the Baptist was baptizing in the region near the Essenes of Qumran, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem are wondering, hey, which one are you? Which one are you? So John the Baptist categorically denied being the Christ. He admitted that he preceded the Christ. He pointed to the Christ, testified about the Christ, but he confessed and did not deny that he was not the Christ. Well, since John was dressed like Elijah and proclaimed a message similar to that of Elijah, they asked John if he was Elijah. And John said, I am not which is an answer that has caused confusion for students of the Bible because Jesus Christ identified John with Elijah. Please notice what Jesus said to Peter, James, and the Apostle John about John the Baptist and Elijah after Jesus had been transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's recorded in Matthew 17, verses 10 through 13. And his disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the son of man is going to suffer at their hands. Look at the next verse. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Question, how do we reconcile John's answer with Jesus' answer? Well, 
When the Jews asked John the Baptist if he was Elijah, they were asking if he was the actual Elijah, the one who was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. There appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them, Elisha and Elijah. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven, meaning Elijah did not die. So they're thinking a physical Elijah is coming back, and John the Baptist, are you the actual Elijah? This is what John was denying, that he was the actual prophet Elijah. But, and this is important, John was not denying that he had come in the spirit and power of Elijah. For it is highly likely that John had heard about that from his father, Zacharias, since he was a child. And why would the priest, Zacharias, John's dad, tell him such a thing? Well, because that's what the angel Gabriel told Zacharias in the temple when it was Zacharias's turn to minister there. Luke chapter 1, verse 13, 16, and 17 records the conversation. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John, and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, here it is, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So, Jesus and John were denying and affirming the same things. That John the Baptist was not the actual Elijah, the prophet, but that John the Baptist had come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Well, number three, who then is the prophet? The prophet they are referring to is mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among you, from your countrymen, you shall listen to him. This is Moses before the children of Israel entered into the promised land. Now, at this time, it was widely held and wrongly believed that the prophet who would ultimately fulfill Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 was separate from the Messiah. But remember the principle I shared with you in the past. We understand the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. And so Peter brings clarification about who the prophet of Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 is. He declared that Jesus Christ is the prophet spoken of by Moses in Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. Notice this, Acts 3 verses 19 and 20 through 22. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, now look at this, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren to him, Messiah. See the link there. You shall give heed to everything he says to you. So John rightly denied that he was the prophet because Jesus is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Now, Let's return to the topic of repentance. When the Bible speaks of repentance, it's important to note that true repentance always bears good fruit. 
True repentance always bears good fruit. And at this point in his gospel, the apostle John does not mention how John the Baptist confronted Israel's religious elite. The truth is, John the Baptist saw right through the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he called them out for their motives. They were corrupt, wealthy, religious leaders who burdened the Jews with their legalistic interpretations of the Mosaic law. So John called them a brood of vipers because they were influenced by and did the work of the serpent of old Satan in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Then in verse 8 of Matthew 3, John commanded them to bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. Why? Because you might be able to fool people, but you can't fool God. Paul says in Galatians 6, God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. You see, people look at the outward appearance, but God looks at what's in our hearts. John confronted the root of the problem. They had religion, but they had no spiritual reality. And Warren Worsby rightly notes, God gets to the root of our lives for the root determines the fruit. That's a good word. The root determines the fruit. You see, when there's true repentance, then there's true change and good fruit in keeping with repentance. And the heart that is truly changed because of repentance says, I do what I do because this is who I now am in Jesus Christ. It's more than just words because words are just lip service. And lip service means nothing to God. You see, God expects good fruit from our lives and lip service never produces the kind of fruit that God's looking for. And you see this with Israel. And that's why we have in Isaiah chapter five, verses three through four, God saying, Give me some answers. He says, look this. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard, meaning the nation of Israel. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? Now, John anticipates the rebuttal. The rebuttal would be, hey, we are children of Abraham. And so in verse 9, John challenged them further, saying, do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. And this is a common belief for the Jews. If, if you're a physical descendant of Abraham, hey, you're good with God. And I can relate to this one. I was raised Roman Catholic. And for many, many years growing up, I thought everything is hunky-dory with God because I'm a Roman Catholic. My grandma's a Roman Catholic. My parents are Roman Catholic. I'm good with God. In fact, I was offended when my evangelical Christian high school friends would start talking to me about Jesus as if I needed Jesus. Hey, I'm good with Jesus because I'm a Roman Catholic. But Abraham was good with God because Abraham had an authentic faith in God. It's not enough to believe that Jesus is the Christ. We must personally ask him to be our savior for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our souls. That's why Paul wrote in Galatians 3, verses 6 and 7, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. You see, you can't get right with God by hitchhiking a ride on someone else's faith. Each person must have their own relationship with God by receiving the forgiveness of their sins and by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. God does not have grandkids. Next, it's important to say a word about baptism. The Bible makes it clear that everyone will be baptized. Let me explain to you what I mean. In Matthew 3, verse 10, John the Baptist warned them that judgment was coming. Quote, the ax is already at the root. 
Then John the Baptist shifted metaphors and mentioned two baptisms in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, in John chapter 1, verse 33, John only mentions one baptism, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But it's important to note the second baptism mentioned in Matthew's gospel, that of fire. It reads this way, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Let's break this down. Jesus Christ promised to send the Holy Spirit after he ascended to heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And this baptism of the Holy Spirit was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in the upper room. And that day marked the beginning of the church age. God's spirit was no longer with God's people. He was indwelling God's people. And now the Holy Spirit is given to all the moment they place their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. He's given to us to do a work of transformation to do a transformation of our souls, that we love what God loves, that we want to do what God wants us to do. And so he empowers us through the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, then you're not a Christian. But all who place their faith in Jesus Christ are baptized in the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit, Paul writes, we were all baptized into one body, the body of Christ. But John the Baptist said that Jesus would also baptize with fire. And while some debate about what John meant, all you need to do is look at the context. Verse 12, it settles the matter. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus Christ is coming back. And when he does, the threshing floor, the earth, he's going to clear it and he's going to organize it into two groups. He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. The wheat are Christians. The chaff are non-Christians. The wheat are brought into the barn, meaning God's presence for all eternity. And the chaff will be burned in fire, meaning the lake of fire. Here's the point. Everyone's going to be baptized. Either with the Holy Spirit because they've trusted in Jesus Christ for their salvation or eternal fire because they've rejected Jesus Christ's offer for salvation. The choice is yours. For those who are here online or who will watch later online, if you haven't settled the matter yet, I beg you in the name of Jesus Christ to receive him as your Savior, to believe in your heart, and to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord for the salvation of your souls, for the forgiveness of your sin. All you need to do is believe, trust, ask, and you will be saved. Settle the matter now. It's of utmost importance. John the Baptist was called to make straight the way of the Lord so that people were prepared to hear the good news that Jesus was going to proclaim. But there was a second part to John's calling, to identify the one who is Messiah. And my second point is this, John testified that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness. We see this with the baptism of Jesus. You see, Jesus came to make a way, a way for us to come to God the Father to have eternal life. Jesus came to be baptized by John the Baptist, but John the Baptist initially resisted and declared he needed to be baptized by Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. Now, why did 
Jesus need to be baptized? Did Jesus need to repent of any sin? No. 1 John 3 verse 5 says, And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. Jesus was baptized in obedience to the Father's will to be identified with those he came to save. John's baptism is different than a Christian baptism. John's baptism to prepare for the coming of Christ. Christian baptism is for those who've already placed their faith in Jesus Christ, a public declaration of their profession of faith. Jesus identified with sinful humanity to make a way between a holy God and a sinful people. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 4, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And as a result, no one comes to the Father but through Jesus. No one comes to the Father but through Jesus. John baptized Jesus, and oh, what a miraculous scene unfolded. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. There we are told the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came down and remained upon Jesus. The voice of the Father declared, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Here you have the Trinity clearly seen in this passage. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God in three co-equal, co-existent persons. The authentication from heaven confirmed that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who makes a way to the Father. And John also testified Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God. After the baptism, we're brought to John chapter 1, verses 32 and 34, and notice what John declares. He testified saying, I've seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the son of God. I've seen, I've testified. Jesus is the Son of God. What's the point? That there's only one way to have a relationship with God. And my friends, Jesus is it. And that's why he said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, some may feel like that's exclusive. Why in the world is Jesus Christ the only way to the Father? Because as John the Baptist said, Jesus is the Lamb of God. John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Going back to what I said earlier, fully God, fully man. Had to be fully God so that his life was of infinite worth to pay the penalty for the sin of all who would trust in him. But fully man in order to identify with sinful humanity and build a bridge between a holy God and a sinful people. Now, we've been talking about the past. I want to jump ahead to the future. You see, one day, when all the saints stand before God's throne in heaven, we are going to worship Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world And I want to share with you the worship song that we are going to sing. Revelation 5, verse 12. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That'd be something we should practice right now, huh? That's what we're going to sing. Now, 
as I close, I find it interesting that the early church was called the way. In Acts chapter 9, verse 2, before the church was called Christians in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. So what has Jesus called us the way to do? Well, to share the way, Jesus Christ, the way to the Father with others. And this is the perfect time to do so. This is the perfect time to do so as we celebrate Jesus Christ's birth this Christmas season. But I feel the sense of urgency. I pray you do too. You see, Jesus Christ is coming back. You and I need to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. For we do not know the hour of his return. And we need to be faithful servants so that when he appears, he will find us doing what he's called us to do. And oh, I am here to tell you, it will be worth it to hear him say, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Matthew 25, verse 21. Can we make that our prayer? Can we make that our prayer? Lord, I want to be like John the Baptist, faithful in sharing Jesus with others. People don't need to know a lot about us. They need to know about Jesus. Amen? Amen. He is what our world needs now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the example of John the Baptist always looking out for, pointing to, and talking about Jesus. That's our prayer tonight, Lord. Make straight the way in our own hearts, Lord. Would you see if there's anything that's distracting us from doing what you've called us to do, to be like John the Baptist and point people to the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. Please use us this next season. Please use us, Lord. We are yours. Empower your church. Revive your church. May we be bold in our witness. May they see and hear the truth, the love, and the grace of God through us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all my brothers and sisters in Christ said, amen. amen. Can we give thanks to our Lord? Amen. Amen. Let's stand in worship. We're going to close. With